adopted and moderated by Dr. Asiya Darwish from the Department of Medical Surgical Nursing from the School of Nursing Midwifery at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Hello, Dr. Darwish from We Are At Your Service. Uh, hello, good evening, and uh, welcome to all uh, dear participants. Um, I, uh, first of all, I should uh, express my deepest uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Marisa Wilson for her invaluable lectures in uh, two last sessions. Uh, and uh, also, I want to ask a participant uh, if you are interested, today we will um, add a, a link of a WhatsApp group for uh, participants of this program in the chat box. You can join us there. And also we will add a Google form for who uh, is interested to pursue uh, MSc of Nursing Informatics in towns, or uh, even you may uh, fill the form um, uh, to uh, inform us about uh, how much you are interested. And uh, this form uh, is optional. Uh, filling this form is optional. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, please continue, Mr. Mohammadi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darwish. Um, previously, a short course entitled Fundamentals of Nursing Informatics was represented by our team. And in the current course entitled Information Management Systems in Nursing, we, had, we have had artificial intel intelligence nursing leadership considerations and re-envisioned informatics competencies for all nurses in first and second session. Uh, presented by Dr. Marisa L. Wilson. And now in, the, in this session, we have nurses role in technology selection, design and implementation presented by Dr. Tanya Azadi, who holds a PhD in health information management with demonstrated background in medical information science, sciences. She has been a lecturer of health informatics, health information resource management, medical information, information systems and more for graduate and undergraduate students at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and Aja University of Medical Sciences since 2015. She has contributed to the translation of two major re reference textbooks into Persian in the fields of healthcare information systems and project management for healthcare information technology as editor and translator. She's also author and reviewer of various papers in the field of health information management and systems. Uh, before starting this session, uh, I have to announce that for next uh, lecture session, the next le lecture session will be uh, attended on 20th of June. And before presenting uh, this session uh, by Dr. Tanya Zadi, we will launch the poll and I sincerely uh, ask you to answer the pretest to continue the meeting. The poll is launched. And we're waiting for you to answer this poll. Thank you, dear participants. One minute left and we have 
about two minutes or more to answer this poll. So I sincerely appreciate your contribution to this pretest. Thank you. Ten percent of our participants. Thank you. Twenty-five percent of our participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thirty-five percent. Thank you. Fifty percent. Thank you. And we're waiting for other participants to answer the pretest. Sixty percent. Thank you. And sixty three. Thank you. Seventy percent. Thank you. I'll end the poll in seconds. Uh, hello, Dr. Azadi. Glad to see you here. How are you? You're at your service. Um, hello. hello. Hello, everyone. Yes, do you have my voice? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Hello, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I'm Tanya Azadi, and thanks for joining us in the session of online short course on information management systems in nursing. Um, first of all, I would like to say a very big thank you to Dr. Darvish and her amazing team 
um, at the School of Nursing and Midwife Area of Tehran University of Medical Sciences for making this um, venue available for us to share knowledge, exchange ideas, and learn. Um, today, my internet is a little bit uh, unstable, so if it's okay, I'm going to uh, turn off my video so, and um, share my slides. Okay. So today uh, we're going to focus on nurses' role in technology selection, design, and implementation. And particularly, I'm going to discuss about technology impacts on nursing process and care, some challenges for nurses in system design and implementation, recognizing uh, the importance of nurses' role in technology implementation. And um, we're going to discuss the SDLC process, which is the system development life cycle. And uh, at the end, I'm going to map some ANA competencies with SDLC process. OK. Uh, the application of modern technology is, um, is not something new in the healthcare setting. And in fact, it's an essential factor um, which is required for the advancement of nursing. Healthcare itself and also continuous monitoring of patients require using bad information and communication technologies. Um, so we have applied technologies in healthcare to do um, a wide range of activities, for instance, to do processing and application of data and information. Uh, we're using it to have easier access to patients history, uh, we're using it to do entry and clinical documentation, to convert data into useful clinical information, to do the exchange of health information. So we can see that generally all four domains of the electronic health, which is the management, the um, clinical decision support systems, communication and information systems have already affected the way that we are doing things in the bedside and also the way we are communicating and, and you know, uh, in a clinical setting. So technology has also had a great impact on nursing practice as well. For instance, it has reduced documentation time of nurses by removing all those paper-based work and then instead providing electronic infrastructure to communicate with that data. It also um, has reduced physical exertion of the staff by removing unnecessary movements between you know, different departments to, par to perform a particular task related to data and information. And now it, uh, it's available through an EHR, which is available from every department on, or every ward in the hospital. So it leads to more productivity. It has also improved the communication between different groups of um, stakeholders, you know, in the healthcare settings, including nurses, patients, and also other healthcare professionals. Um, by providing just different tools and systems, such as the electronic health records or also patient portals, which facilitates this communication. Ultimately, all this um, advancement by the technology improves patient safety. And through providing us an integrated entire medical history of patients, which is available to every department for authorized persons in the hospital. So it just improves the safety and the patient's outcome. So on the whole, we can see that ICT have already had a great impact on nurses practice, uh, including planning, providing documentation, doing the clinical services and also reviewing the clinical here. Um, here I have brought you with some examples from the literature where technology actually facilitated the nursing care. So um, in this slide, you can see that a systematic review was performed in 2017 to see what dimensions or what aspects of nursing care would be under the influence of uh, 
let's say, different um, examples of information and communication technology. So in this review, okay, they, they identified 19 aspects. One is time management, time spent on patient care, documentation time, information quality and access, quality of documentation, knowledge updating and utilization, nurse autonomy, intro and interprofessional collaboration, nurses competencies and skills, nurse patient relationship, assessment, care planning and evaluation, teaching of patients and their families, communication and coordination of the care, perspectives of the quality of care which is provided, and nurses and patient satisfaction and dissatisfaction toward using the ICTs, patient comfort and quality of life, empowerment and functional status. So as you can see, it's a wide range of uh, nursing aspects that has been under um, the influence of ICTs. The results of this review um, has an important implication for us. And that is when it's time to plan and need to implement, for instance, um, an example of technologies in healthcare settings, we should keep this broad picture in mind to be fully aware of some potential areas which could be under the influence of nursing care. Here, as, uh, here is another example. So it's an RCT in 22, which was performed to evaluate the effect of the uh, kind of information system, which is the intensive care information system on nursing activities. So this um, intensive care information system was implemented in a medical surgical uh, ICU in a teaching hospital in Amsterdam. And uh, they wanted to see if the quality of um, clinical documentation would be increased with the introduction of this new system. So the results uh, was interesting. Using this uh, information system actually reduced the time that nurses needed to spend on documentation up to 30%, which is, I guess, well, significant. And they used this time to reallocate to patient care. Um, so, and this study, it increased the duration of um, admission procedure, but it reduced documentation time. So by using this system, they uh, spent more time on, uh, you know, patient care. Okay, here is another example. Again, it's a mixed method study. And they wanted to see how introduction of a of an work system would improve um, nursing time and patient safety. So this system, which uh, which was a work system for nurses, was implemented in three units at two facilities in the U.S. And by using this system, they uh, understood that they could save times from sixty percent, sixteen percent to. 32% and requests for missing medication dropped from three to one per day and nurse medication room trips, you know, to go and to make modific modification to those errors were just reduced by uh, 30%. So as you can see the time the, uh, that using that system improved nursing um, activity and it could achieve significant time saving. It reduced uh, missing medication requests, it lowered um, reported medication errors, and also it reduced the trips to medication rooms to just you know make modifications. Okay, here is another example. Again, a mixed method study to evaluate the effectiveness of an electronic nursing record system, which was implemented in a general hospital in the Netherlands. And uh, it's interesting, this example, regarding the implementation process, nurses were really positive about the whole setup and implementation and everything, especially the contribution of the project team, you know, um, so the staff, external expertise, training, all were positive and nurses were happy with that. 
However, the study indicated that no time efficiency was achieved and actually it had a bad effect on nurses accept, um, acceptance toward the system. So I just brought this example to see that um, the impact of um, um, actually implementation of information systems in hospitals or healthcare systems is not always positive. And it has uh, challenges for nurses or other even healthcare professionals. And uh, if something goes wrong, then the, the rate of the acceptance of the system would be decreased and then they're not willing to use that system. So I'm trying to say that although the benefits of um, technology increases healthcare quality, we also need to consider that there are some disadvantages that might, that might result in work errors, you know, using that system. So although it's promising, I mean, the application of technology in healthcare setting, but uh, we should be also aware about the factors which hinder technology realization. Here, uh, there are four reasons, for instance, bad technological design that do not observe human factors or bad te technological interface, which uh, with the patient or the environment and also the whole stakeholders or end users who are using that system, inadequate planning for implementing new technologies and inadequate maintenance plan, which means providing enough support and uh, you know, training for the users. Uh, here you can see a figure and it's just another perspective towards some factors which hinders technology realization. Um, generally, they can be classified into six categories, challenges or issues related to setup or implementation, challenges related to regulations, challenges related to financial matters, uh, challenges related to the profession itself, organizational issues, and also personal matters. So I'm going, I'm, I'm going to discuss um, each of these categories and provide with some recommendations from the literature. So the first category is the implementation. Um, you can see that implementation refers to technical matters or setup issues and um, they include some difficulties and problems related to the system and the application or the software itself. Examples are high workload from one hand and time deficit from another hand, which is required for you know, adequate documentation, for instance, um, assessment of nursing in amnesis and preparation of all those nursing care plans and embedding them into system is just a really exhaustive task and it just requires much effort, time and documentation. So if something went wrong, then the output and the result would be, uh, you know, would go wrong as well. Or another challenge is that using the system is just more time consuming. For instance, it needs too, more, too many clicks. It's not comprehensive enough or if you're getting confused with so many different screens and templates, which are not easy to understand as the paper-based were. So generally the interface of the system is not user-friendly and users are not happy with uh, how to use the system. Okay, sometimes aims of the information system which have been implemented is unclear. For instance, the aim of the system is raising productivity and reducing staff instead of being, you know, improving quality of care, which could lead to so this um, confusion in the aim of the system leads to unsatisfaction, unhappiness of users who are using the system because they want to improve the patient outcome, not to improve, you know, the productivity. And another challenge in this category is that computers and networks have a lot of maintenance problems which are not addressed or supported after the system is implemented. So it just leaves the healthcare staff with different bugs while using the system and uh, there is no maintenance or technical support for hardware or software. So these are these were uh, just some examples related to implementation or setup. Another category of challenges are related to the regulation. And you can see some examples here. For instance, there is lack of policy or 
uh, or procedures that uh, govern how to use the technology. It's through both at, this, um, at the institutional level as well as the national level, or there is lack of laws or legislation that govern the, for instance, EHR or HIS adoption, or there is lack of data protection and confidentiality policies, again, both at its institutional and national level, or um, there is lack of legislation on, um, you know, supervision of uh, data protection, data confidentiality, and data use, again, both at national and institutional level. So, uh, the higher level um, organizations, such as ministries, ministries of health, should start developing um, rules and regulations, both on the national level and also the organizations at the institutional level, to make sure that um, hospitals actually, um, you know, are uh, regulated on how to use uh, the technology. They have a framework and they are fully aware of all potential aspects on technology adoption and use. And they, for instance, um, regarding data confidentiality and data, protect data protection, there are policies which governs if, um, for instance, data is released, then some kind of penalties have to be implemented and uh, policies like that. So another um, category is the um, financial matters. Instances are related to, for instance, high initial costs of implementation or high cost related to the maintenance of the system and providing you know, backup services, supporting services, training services, lack of resources, capital resources to invest in the field of health information technologies, or mm, there hasn't been any feasibility studies done on the uh, benefits uh, or the costs of implementing and using EHR. So uh, the hospital management or the healthcare uh, management uh, is not informed about the benefits versus the cost. Uh, so there's uncertainty about existing um, return on investment after implementing. Mm, conducting feasibility studies that show the benefits versus the costs of implementing uh, would provide you know, support through the request for funding of such project, for instance, from the Minister of Ministries of Health. And such feasibility studies could draw you know, expectations and forecasting on the return on investment so there is no confusion. Uh, there are also some challenges related to the profession itself. And by professional barriers, we usually mean, um, you know, issues related to healthcare professionals, attitudes, motives, job, job responsibilities. For instance, you can see that. Um, from the professional size, uh, side, there is no enough support to use the EHR, or they have lack of time to learn the system and to receive training on how to use the system. Or maybe sometimes they have this belief that using the system just adds more work, or it just needs more time or more effort to work with. It's just so difficult to use the system. Or, um, for instance, uh, using the system adds more professional responsibilities and, and we do not have enough time to just uh, responsible for more tasks. Or it just slows down the work or decreases the productivity. Um, so if we want to address some kind of problems, we have to make sure that we're providing enough support to healthcare professionals who are using, you know, the EMR, and um, for instance, uh, healthcare professional support would be much better if developers and implementers of the system took into account their different needs during very those initial stages of the system implementation. And actually, it's one of the very important areas that nurse informaticists could have a vital, a vital role. We will see actually how in some slides later. 
Also, we have some challenges related to the organization, organization itself, such as workflow design um, or hospital management itself, or issues related to the implementation of the system, which the organization is kind of responsible, or issues related to ma project management issues. Um, for instance, too little guidance uh, is provided on the ward after the system goes live or after the system is implemented. Or training have occurred during the pilot phase and it wasn't enough. Or it wasn't tailored to the needs of um, end users such as nurses and other clinicians who are using the system. Or um, there is not enough hardware provisions uh, at the world where the system is implemented. For example, there are not enough laptops or um, terminals or you know, connection to the internet and internet. And um, maybe there is a, a low number of specialists on, the, uh, you know, on how to use the system. For example, a health informatics specialist or a nurse informatics specialist to provide support and training, particularly for, for their colleague. Uh, or the workflow needs some redesign to get match uh, with the system. Um, or implementation just took more time than expected. So these are just some examples related to the bad project management, which is um, in turn related to the organization itself. Or sometimes it's, it may be because the hospital management doesn't have uh, enough experience to choose the right system or to implement the right system or they do not know how to evaluate the system to identify some problems in very initial stages of the implementation. Or, um, you know, they cannot provide monitoring or protection toward using the HR or HIS. And in fact, if they had kind of strategic planning for the adoption and implementation of the system, uh, much of these problems wouldn't occur or if they have occurred, uh, they, they would um, have, you know, kind of solution um, to address them. So the system implementation should be informed by project management plan and the organization have a pivotal role in that. So it includes all those time frames and schedules. And um, so they know um, when is the right time to implement that system and when the staff are ready to adopt that, to adopt the system. And um, hospital management should develop a strategic plan for adoption in implementation and also future development of the system. Okay, um, the final category is uh, issues which related to some personal matters and Examples are include, you know, some behavioral and attitude factors, lack of knowledge and motivation of some of the users, including nurses or healthcare professionals. So it's, it's just a barrier toward using the system or there is lack of knowledge and skills toward computers and information systems. And uh, maybe they feel that uh, it's just so many changes happening in a very short time. So it's, it will be overwhelming. And uh, generally all those negative beliefs and uh, impression about health IT solutions uh, are, uh, are discussed in this category. So one thing we can do is um, improving the awareness of the importance and benefits of um, using health information systems. And um, so it should be developed by focusing on, on the topic through a multi-phase approach. For instance, starting from the level of medical schools and nursing colleges. So the, the necessity or the importance of benefits of using um, uh, ICT should be provided uh, inside the education at undergraduate level and also postgraduate level. So um, the future nurses or future healthcare professionals already are already ready, you know, to uh, to get involved with different aspects of um, technology. Okay, so considering the nature of these obstacles, um, we can see that many of them could be addressed by nurses, and they could have a role in it. As these problems, at least many of them 
relate to different aspects of integrating nursing care and healthcare process with technology. So the importance of a nurse's role in technology implementation have been recognized by different uh, you know, programs and acts and legislations. And many mandates actually stipulated um, that healthcare facilities must uh, collect patient information electronically. So a sharp increase in hospital computer systems um, in which uh, they are able to store this information has emerged. I've brought some examples here and um, I'm not going to discuss thoroughly each of these acts and legislations. Uh, it's in the US context, which has helped a lot but I'm going to, pro to provide you with some you know, general information about how these acts actually have facilitated the adoption and implementation of health information technologies um, in the US, which leads to recognizing the significance of the role of healthcare professionals, including nurses in HIT using adoption. So the first uh, one, uh, the first program is the meaningful use incentive program. So um, the meaningful use incentive program was established by health information technology for economic and clinical health or high tech act of 2009 and was created by the centers for Medicare and Medicaid in um, 2011. So it's basically about utilization of a certified EHR system to improve the quality, safety, and efficiency, um, reduce health disparities, improve care coordination, improve population and public health, and engage patients and their families more and more in their own health care. You know, and to ensure that also patient privacy and security is maintained, which is according to the HIPAA rule. Uh, so basically, it is a set of um, federally imposed requi reporting requirements that healthcare providers are required to meet. Uh, you can see the goal of the uh, meaningful use. And um, so initially, it provided uh, some, you know, um, you know, motivation to accelerate the adoption of electronic health record systems. Physicians who fail, eligible physicians who fail to, par to participate in this uh, meaningful use program will, will receive penalty in the form of reduced reimbursement. So it's also good to know that the meaningful use eventually become part of another program, which is called Medicare Merit-Based Incentive Program. And it's just a new opportunity to revise and improve the existing Medicare program. Okay. I'm not going to discuss this further, but uh, because I'm not a Medicare expert, but I just brought this example to show how legislation actually facilitated the widespread use and adoption of e EHR in the US and embedding the system into healthcare system, which resulted in more you know, integrated and safe use uh, and implementation of HIT. Another legislation which really helped is the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act. And um, it was created in uh, 2005 in response to a growing concern about patient safety in the US. So the goal was to improve patient safety um, by encouraging voluntary and also confidential reporting of events that adversely affect patients. So this act just highlights the focus on how patient safety event information is collected, developed, analyzed, and maintained. So uh, you can see also a small figure here, um, which is usually referred to as soup of PSQIA. It con consists of three elements of PSO, which is the Patient Safety Organization, the PSES, which is the uh, Patient Safety Evaluation System, which provides you know, enough structure and processes to allow the reporting 
um, you know, of those events which adversely affect patients. And the PSWP, which is that product or that analysis or that record which is produced um, to be uh, submitted, you know, to a PSL. So again, um, this act has also driven the nurse informaticist to be a key contributor to the efforts of, you know, creating clinical documentation systems that will enable um, accurate collection of information. So a nurse informaticist role clearly encompasses designing, building, and testing clinical system, which uh, makes able to report those events, you know, which are adverse, adversely or affecting patients. Another example is the um, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act or PPACA, which is sometimes called as healthcare reform or the Obamacare. Um, th this act has several major aims and um, it has five aims. And the fourth aim is about strengthening the primary healthcare access and uh, bringing about you know, longer term changes in the availability of primary care for all people. And it, it includes HIV requirements for all healthcare providers as well. So in this act, the long-term goal uh, is to have a national um, EHR database or a set of interoperable systems. Uh, so this system has data which is mineable for public health and pharmaceutical research. And any healthcare provider can access a patient's record to provide the care. And we have a complete patient information for you know, accurate decision making. Again, this act um, contributed to the widespread and widespread development and adoption of HIT, especially having a national EHR database or a set of interoperable systems which, in, in which health and clinical information would be exchanged between different healthcare organizations. Okay, um, the final example I want to speak about is the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act or the High Tech. So um, it enacted, it was enacted as part of another act, which is the American Recovery and Reinvestment of 2009. And the goal was to promote again the adoption and the meaningful use of HIT. Um, sometimes, it's called also the Health Information Technology Initiative. And in fact, it's an integral part of the uh, PPACA or that Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which is, I just discussed in the previous slide. And it requires and incentivizes all healthcare providers you know, to move records to an approved patient management system. And the ultimate goal again is to have one integrated medical record for patients which is accessible by all healthcare providers. Um, this act also widens the scope of HIPAA, which is um, acts related to the privacy and security protection of patient information. So we can see that how these legislations have impacted the wide implementation and adoption of EHR. And um, so putting more emphasis on the role of uh, nurses and also other physicians um, in using technology. In fact, not only in using technology, but also taking up more roles, active roles in designing the system, building the system, testing the system, uh, because they are their end users. Okay. Um, now that we have this broad picture of um, how legislation have actually contributed to the widespread and extended use of technology at healthcare, uh, let, us some, uh, let us discuss also from the pivotal role of data on decision-making in healthcare setting. Everybody knows that sound and reliable information is just the foundation for decision-making across the health system. And uh, we need this healthcare information for a variety of tasks in the healthcare system. We can see some examples here. For instance, providers 
need data to treat the patients and um, choose between the best treatment options. Payers also need the data to just confirm the eligibility of a treatment which is provided for patient. Uh, as we saw the examples through the, you know, the meaningful use reimbursement and also the other incentive programs. Researchers also need data for various comparative, you know, outcome analysis and research. Regulators and policymakers also uh, require data to make decisions, cost-effective decisions that uh, would have, you know, direct impact on the public health and well-being of all citizens. And in fact, more, in, more importantly, the patients themselves uh, needs the data to take more autonomy, responsibility, and roles under self-care plan. So uh, healthcare information is, um, is really important for us. You saw that, but is of little value if it's not available in the formats that meet the needs of these multiple users who are, you saw, you, who are policymakers, planners, managers, healthcare providers. So information systems are technology solutions which respond to these demands of all these stakeholders. And in fact, information systems are um, you know, a critical force that would significantly improve healthcare quality. So, as I said, to maximize the usefulness of this information, um, healthcare organization must manage it, just like the management that they do for other resources, like their human resources or their staff or physical resources. So a health information system encompasses a, a range of technology in healthcare to just collect, store, deliver, analyze, and retrieve medical and health data. So um, in hospital and in healthcare environments, this technology information systems is just one of the most important components for delivering you know, the healthcare services. Um, information systems just uh, provide us with four key functions for decision-making. You can see data generation, compilation, analysis and synthesis, and communication and use. So a good health information system brings together all relevant partners um, to ensure that users of the system have just access to high quality information, which is usable, understandable, and comparative, and also is shareable between different healthcare organizations. Um, please note that um, we use the acronym HIS for referring to hospital information system as well, but here, when I refer to HIS, I mean a more general system, that is the health information system. Okay. Um, before we open up the discussion on how nurses actually contribute to the system implementation and design, I just want to provide you with some examples of um, healthcare information systems and briefly discuss some of their most important functions. Um, as you can see, healthcare information systems or HIS is just a broad terminology. Uh, and it, it is used when we want to refer to electronic systems which are designed to manage the healthcare data. Um, so, Usually there are different types of health information systems and they can be applied in all areas of nursing practice, including clinical, administration, education and research. Today, we're not going, um, I mean, I'm not going to discuss about information systems which are used for education and research in nursing, but uh, the more emphasis is on the clinical practice and also the administration. So the first of the systems, which uh, you have heard a lot about it, is the electronic health records and the electronic medical records. Um, they are also called together computer-based uh, patient record or the CPR. So EMR and EHR systems, uh, you know that, replace paper patient records 
and the medical information on each patient is collected and is stored electronically inside the EMR and EHR. These records usually include patient health information, test results, a doctor and a specialist visits, healthcare treatments. EMR, particularly, is an electronic medical rec record uh, that the health and clinical information of the patient is stored in it. And it, uh, it usually isn't shareable between different healthcare providers. And that is the main difference of EMR with the EHR. So it is used inside a specific healthcare system. And the type of information which usually goes to EMR include allergies, medication, family history, diagnoses, surgery information, progress notes, and also demographics. An EHR is a more complete overview of patient history and can contribute all this information that EMR has plus more. So information such as visits to other healthcare professionals, insurance information, records of hospitalization, and even more is stored in the EHR. So while EMR uh, may be required to get printed to get shared between different healthcare organizations, EHR is just shareable because it's a digital record that contains everything that the EMR has on plus more. So as I said, it's the more, it's the most uh, important difference between the EHR and the EMR and, and it is that EHR is shareable within different health organizations, but EMR may have to be printed to get shared. Another example is the um, CPOE or computerized physician order entry. It's sometimes also called computerized provider order entry or computerized provider order management system. So it's a system um, which realizes the process of electronic entry of medical pra practitioner instructions. So it helps to the electronic prescription of the system. So information such as medication, laboratory, radiology orders can be um, you know, uh, stored electronically via a computer or an information system. Uh, and while well, the CPOE is really matters because it reduces, it contributes to reducing the errors and improve patient safety, because at a minimum, CPOE can help the organization um, reduce errors by ensuring that some standardized and complete orders have been documented. And sometimes if the CPOE includes some built-in clinical decision support tools, then system uh, automatically provides some alerts, for instance, for drug interactions or medication allergies and also other potential problems. So in this way, CPOE really contributes to reduce errors. It also improves efficiency because for instance, by enabling providers to submit orders, uh, orders electronically, CPOE helped the organization uh, to get the medication and laboratory and radiology orders to pharmacies, laboratories, and radiology facilities faster. So it saves time. And in this way, it improves the efficiency. It also have a role to improving the reimbursement because some orders, especially in the US system, requires pre-approvals from the insurers. So CPOE went integrated with an electronic practice management system, just can flag those orders which requires the pre-approval, and in this way helps to reduce, you know, um, denied insurance claims. So, in short, it's safer and it's more efficient for for not also the providers but also for the patient patients. Another system, which again um, you have heard a lot, is the clinical information system, that is also uh, sometimes called point of care systems. So a clinical information, mm, a clinical information system is designed to uh, just capture and store and process data and share it um, among other decision makers. So it's mostly used by different parts of the hospitals, such as laboratories, pharmacies, radiologies, even ICUs. So 
each of these wards can have their own clinical information system. For instance, um, a CIS or clinical information system can include health history, prescriptions, doctor notes, dictation, all other information that is kept together electronically. As I said, we can have some sub uh, information systems of the CIS. For instance, we can have a laboratory information system or a nursing information system or a radiology information system. For instance, a laboratory information system allows doctors and lab technicians to coordinate you know, um, inpatient and outpatient tests for different tests in, um, in the medical setting, like microbiology tests, hematology tests, chemistry, immunology tests, and to manage these uh, specific data. So it's a specific standard information system uh, which manages patient specific data. Um, another biggest benefit of this um, clinical information systems is that it allows uh, communication to happen faster between these different departments of the hospital. Okay. The next system we're going to introduce is the Clinical Decision Support System, or a CDSS. And as the name suggests, they are designed to suggest what is the next step for treatment. So they can provide um, healthcare providers with some information they may be unaware and catch some potential problems in advance. Like a patient, for instance, um, uh, drug interaction or um, allergies, you know. So the system provides alerts in advance. CDSS uh, analyzes data, both from clinical and administrative systems. And as, uh, as I said, the ultimate goal is to help um, healthcare providers in getting informed clinical decisions. So as you can see in this very simple conceptual model of uh, CDSS, you can see that it mainly consists of um, a medical knowledge component, which is combined with patient data, which works through an inference engine to make or to provide those clinical advice. Another example is patient portals. And as the name suggests, it is more uh, specific to patients. So a patient portal provides online access to patients' personal information, um, including previous appointments, medical history, diagnosis, and even more. So um, in most cases, a patient portal can be accessed through any device, whether it's a mobile phone or a laptop or a tablet with internet connection. So it provides a uh, 24 hours, seven days a week basis access to this information. So patients, as you can see in the picture, can do a, a wide variety of tasks in the system. They can access to appointment information. Um, they can have access to their medications they may be receiving. Uh, their, they can have access to their laboratory results via the internet. So, also, it facilitates active communication between patients and healthcare prof professionals. For instance, they can send emails or um, they may use some uh, chat systems in that patient portal to just get uh, in touch with their healthcare professionals. My last example here is the practice management software or PMS. It is also called healthcare information system and it's a specific meaning. And um, it actually um, assists the healthcare system or the healthcare facility and personnel with the management and uh, um, operating the daily functions of the hospital or of a facility. So it includes scheduling of patients, uh, binding patient reminders and other administrative tasks. 
So regardless of size of a you know, single practice to a huge multi-center hospital, it can be used uh, by all healthcare providers. And in this system, PMS, the ultimate goal is to just automate you know, administrative tasks, which is part of, uh, part of the you know, business process of a facility. Um, this system also can be used by um, other allied healthcare professionals, such as a physiologist or a psychotherapist. Okay. Uh, in this discussion, types of information systems, we have also other systems, such as master patient index or MPI or um, remote patient monitoring systems, but we're not going to discuss it now. I just want to emphasize on this fact that sometimes a health information system is not defined by any of these systems we covered today. Instead, they are a much comprehensive solution. For instance, they are a kind of all-in-one uh, telehealth system or practice management system. So, the solution, that all-in-one solution, for example, is designed to help not only the clinic to take, you know, to do the clinical process, but also to handle the administrative uh, part of the system to reduce costs and, you know, improve patient experience and satisfaction. So they may include a light EMR for the physician and also uh, a patient portal for patients, you know, to be able to get in touch with healthcare providers to receive their lab results, you know, to make appointments. So it's an integrated EMR patient portal or a PMS. Now let's see a nurse's role really in technology selection, design and implementation, implementation after all this discussion about the importance of healthcare um, information technology. So a nurse informaticist um, as a clinical system analyst may be involved in different uh, parts of this HIT, for instance, in selection, design, and implementation. Nurse informaticists are required to be part of this process as they understand the clinical flow and the patient care process better than anyone else um, in comparison with the system analyst. Um, so nurses working in clinical settings, as I said, um, are in just better position to evaluate if the system is useful, if it's working, if, for example, their other colleagues are happy using that, and also they're in a better position to judge and to identify some potential problems. So involvement of nurses could address common problems that may arise due to ill-designed of a system. Um, as we saw in my early in my presentation, and um, as well as my, the slides that I'm going to go further um, later tonight. Okay, um, just a brief discussion here. The need of nurses to be part of this process in particular and having competent healthcare professionals in general have long been recognized by different organizations. You can see some examples here, for instance, the re-envisioned essentials by the American Association of Colleges of Nursing or the advanced health informatic competencies by the American Medical Informatics Association emphasizes on educating and hiring competent healthcare professionals. In all of these recommendations and also other high-level policies, one major domain is to be competent in information and healthcare technology. This discussion was thoroughly discussed by Professor Wilson last Saturday, and I'm not going to repeat these domains and competencies, which are needed by all healthcare professionals, including nurses. But I just wanted to once more emphasize on um, how nursing education and practice is re-envisioned and the domain of information and healthcare technology is being integrated into it. Okay. Dr. Azadi, sorry for interruption. Do you agree to have a break for 10 minutes? Sure, sure, no problem. 
So for 10 minutes, we have a break and then we'll be back for the continuous of today's meeting. Okay. Hello, I'm Tom. Warmest congratulations on your acceptance to Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Can we start now or yes, should we uh, wait? But before the continuance of today's meeting, um, I have to announce that um, our next uh, lecture session is not the next Saturday. And it, it will be on 20th of June. And its topic will be clinical information systems in nursing presented by Dr. Melody Rose. So we'll have the continuance of today's lecture session with Dr. Tanya Azadi. Thank you, Dr. Azadi. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so um, as I said, nurses could be involved in different aspects of, uh, you know, technology selection, design, and implementation. And uh, they may be involved in developing theories, analyzing the information needs, um, contributing toward selecting information systems, designing information systems, testing that system, training users. So it's uh, what we call it system development life cycle. So let's see what system development life cycle is. So it's a systematic approach of the analysis and design of the information system. So it's a stepwise process. And this approach holds this view that systems are best developed through the use of um, specific cyclic uh, process. You can see a figure here. It is divided into seven phases. So phase one is identifying problems, opportunities, and objectives. Phase two is determining human information requirements. Phase three, analyzing system needs. Phase four, designing the recommended system. Phase five, developing and documenting the software. Phase six, testing and maintaining the system. And phase seven is implementing and evaluating the system. So at the end of the phase seven, um, it, well, it's a cycle. If new problems or space for improvements arises, then the cycle goes on. So phase one uh, is identifying problems, opportunities, and objectives. So it's the first phase. And in this stage, it's crucial uh, to identify what, what the problem is that the information system is going to address. Mm, because no one wants to waste, you know, time, energy, and resources addressing the wrong problem. So this phase, uh, it's really important. And in this phase, the system analysts have to look at what's occurring inside a healthcare system and why the technology wants to be implemented. 
opportunities or some situations that could be improved through the use of information system. And the nurses need to be involved in those initial stages to identify problem and also uh, some spaces for improvement because they know the clinical process better than anyone else. Identifying objectives is also another important component of this phase. And the nurse informaticist must get engaged in discovering what the healthcare provider is trying to do. You can see the people who are involved in this phase and activities which is performed in this phase include um, you know, some inter interviewing with different users, different stakeholders, and summarizing uh, the knowledge which is obtained, uh, analyzing that needs, and in the end, uh, estimating the scope of the project and documenting the results. So the output of this phase is that feasibility report that I mentioned earlier in my presentation, which contains a problem definition. So phase two is determining um, human information requirements. So in this phase, the analyst and also the clinical analyst, which could be a nurse or a nurse informaticist, understand what information needs people have, the clinician have from system. So at this point, uh, the analyst examines how to make the system more useful to people who are involved. Some questions to consider are, how can the system better support individual tasks? Uh, or what new tasks are enabled by the new system? Or for instance, how can the new system be created to extend you know, a user's capabilities beyond what the old system is providing? Uh, another important aspect of this phase is um, some consideration about human computer interaction. Again, some questions to consider are, what are the user's physical strengths and limitation? In other words, what needs to be done to make the system more legible, more safe? Uh, is the system or the interface is easy to use, easy to understand? Is it fun to use? Are users will be happy using or uh, interacting with that system? Uh, different methods will be used to identify the information requirement needs. Uh, I'm not going to discuss each of these uh, methods, but they include interactive methods such as interviewing, joint application design or JAD or surveying or unobtrusive methods such as sampling, observing or agile um, methods such as prototyping, rapid application developments and agile modeling. Um, again, the people who are involved in this phase, you can see um, frontline nurses, the system analysts, and even the operation workers and managers, such as clinical nurse leaders and nurse informaticists. So in this phase, who, the people who are involved, what, the business activity, where the environment in which the system is going to be implemented, when the timing, how the current procedure are performed should be answered. So the third phase of the SDLC process is analyzing the needs of a system itself. So some special tools and techniques will be implemented to identify the needs of the system or the software. Tools such as data flow diagrams or DFD, charts, processes, outputs of the business functions, activity diagrams, sequence diagrams would be applied by the system analyst to illustrate system you know, in a structured and graphical form, which would be understandable for the programmer, which is going to do the programming or coding of the software. In this phase, nurse informaticists could also play a role to supervise, for example, if use of a medical terminology or patient care data relevant to a system is being considered or not. So during this phase, the system analyst um, analyzes structured decisions. And there are some methods and ways to do that, such as um, decision tables and decision trees. And as, as I said, contribution of a nurse informaticist or vital 
because they're the only one who can contribute in analyzing clinical questions or clinical flows. So although it could be some technical, but the contribution of a clinical nurse to just um, make clear those clinical questions are vital. The phase, um, at the end of the phase, um, actually uh, three, the system analysts prepares a system proposal that summarizes all those information that have been gathered during that information requirement analysis phase and makes some recommendations on if the healthcare organization needs to proceed with a new system or not. So the next phase is designing the recommended system. And in fact, in this phase, a logical, a conceptual and logical design of the information system would be provided. Uh, and the data from this phase will be used by the programmer or the person who do the coding at the next phase to come up with a you know, initial solution of the software. In this phase, the user interface also is designed with the help of users to make sure that the system is you know, audible, safe and legible, and also it's attractive, it's fun to use. For, for instance, uh, the interface may include using a keyboard to type some sort of questions or answers or to demonstrate some, you know, on screen menus to extract user commands or a variety of other graphical user interfaces. So the design phase um, usually includes the designing database that will store much of the data which is needed to be collected in that organization. And um, in this phase, um, the analyst also works on design outputs. For, for example, the, the kind of information which needs to be printed or needs to be you know, um, shown on, on the screens and um, outputs like that. Also in this phase, analysts works on uh, backup procedures, you know, to protect the system and um, to produce some kind of some kind of information packets for the programmers. The next phase, which is phase five, is developing and documenting the software. So it's the phase of the coding the program and translating all those information needs and system needs into the program language. So in this phase, the analyst work with the programmer to develop um, any original software which is needed. Um, clinical analysts, um, such, as, such as a nurse informaticist also have a role uh, in this phase because in this phase, uh, analyst has to work with users like nurses or uh, clinicians or other healthcare providers who are using the system to provide some procedure manuals on how to use the system, some online help, some websites which features frequently asked questions, you know, so it needs to be in line with the information needs of those nurses and clinicians which were um, interviewed at the information requirement analysis phase. You know, these questions must be in line with those initial questions. Uh, and this documentation tell users how to use the software and what to do if the software problems uh, occur. Okay. Um, a software developer can understand the requirements which the system analyst provided, but there are many other things such as terminologies that may require the guidance of a healthcare professional. For instance, a nurse um, informaticist could provide guidance on use of medical terminologies which are needed to be embedded in the system. So in this phase, alerts, technical alerts um, coding program, nurses must work closely with the IT team for defining those standard, for instance, nursing terminology to outline and define their nursing scope and patient care. So the nurse informaticist can learn coding and take up role as a coder, but it's not really necessary for him or her. If she or he is willing, she can do so, but um, her role is not doing the uh, coding, 
but provide supervision and guidance on the clinical workflow, which is going to be embedded in the information system. Um, anyway, if the nurse informaticist to learn the coding, it just, uh, it just would enhance some collaboration and understanding between the software team and the healthcare professionals. So the phase six is testing and maintaining the system. Well, before an information system can be used, it must be tested to identify some potential problems before the system is widely you know, um, available and accessible by all other users in the healthcare setting. Some of this um, testing could be done by the programmers. Some of them could be done by the system analyst in collaboration with the programmers. And usually test plans um, are created very early in the SDLC process. Um, and they get refined and they get modified as the project goes, you know, goes further. Maintenance also is another task which has to be done in this phase and also documentation. And um, for the system testing, clinical nurses, uh, again, could have an important role because you are just the best judge to assess if the uh, system is doing what it is expected to do or they are the best judge <clears throat> to assess if there are some challenges that may hinder uh, the functioning of a system. So it's really important for decision makers to involve nurses before a system or an application is adopted because they remain, uh, you know, the most important link between too many clinical processes in the healthcare process. Testing is really an important phase because it directly influ influences the acceptability of the system. And as I said, they can take a, a role as a test analyst or a tester to check you know, the credibility of the software or to identify some potential um, challenges the system may have. The final phase um, in this SDLC process is implementing and evaluating the system. So it's the last phase of the system development and um, the analysts um, helps implement the information system, which is the go live process. And well, it's the most interesting and also the most challenging part of the process. The software is adopted and used by many users in this phase. And um, again, although the system has went through the testing process, but also in this phase, the system encounters some unthinkable problems as the IT goes live. So um, again, the, uh, you know, the system may or may not produce some desirable results as expected. So at this point, the system can take progress of every individual users and see if they are actually using the system and they are happy with using the system. For example, a software is developed <clears throat> with an intent to save nursing time. But the data or the log of the system shows that, shows something else, and that nurses are not comfortable using the system or they find it difficult to access. So such problems can be identified when the software is fully in action in the clinical setting. So it's just something normal that happens in this phase as well. Nurses, again, in this phase can not only identify such problems, but uh, they are in better position to suggest some alternative for the problem which has happened. And in fact, even it could be more practical the alternatives that the nurses are suggesting and even they could be more relevant clinically because you know they're doing uh, the clinical work and they're just in better position in comparison with the system analyst to suggest some al alternatives. Okay. Um, this last phase also includes training. So um, we train users how to work with the system. 
Vendors, if you're buying a system from vendors, they also provide some kind of training, but the supervision of the training is the responsibility of the analysts as well as the clinical analyst, which is the um, you know, nurse informaticist. So the analyst needs to plan for a smooth conversion from old system to the new one as well, because we may have already an old system and or we may not have an old system. They are just paperwork that have to be electronically, you know, data entered into a new system. So this phase, all those uh, conversion happens and it includes converting files from old formats to new one. Evaluation also is, uh, included as part of this last phase, evaluation of the system. And um, actually, uh, evaluation takes place during every phase, every seven, phase of, of, uh, seven phases of the SDLC process. And a key criterion that must be satisfied is whether the intended users are using, are really using the system or not. So it should be noted that systems work is cyclic. So as you saw, it's a cycle. And when an analyst finishes one phase of system development and proceeds to the next, discovery of a problem may force the analyst to go back to previous phase and modify the work that has been done. So uh, that's why we say that system work is cyclic. Okay, um, after the system is installed, it must be maintained. Uh, and it means that the computer programmers must be modified and kept up to date. Maintenance usually performed for two reasons. The first of this is to correct software errors. So no matter how thoroughly the system is tested, always bugs or errors just creep into computer programs. And the other reason for doing the system maintenance is to enhance you know, the software capabilities. And um, you know, for instance, adding new, new features and new capabilities to the system. Because the organization needs me you know, change and um, Usually this uh, enhancement uh, involves one of these following situations. For instance, users may ask for additional features uh, and it happens usually after they become familiar with the computer system and its capabilities. So now they're happy to see that all the works are uh, done with you know, more precision in the quality of, for instance, the clinical documentation has been increased. The retrieve of information is happening so they asked for more features to be done electronically and through the information system. Or maybe the organization change all the time. So new needs or new demands uh, may be asked to be added to the new system. And the final factor is about the hardware and software themselves that, well, they're just changing at an accelerated pace. And every day we can see that some technologies have been uh, out of dated and we need to update the system with more, for instance, um, high tech softwares and hardwares, which uh, just analyze the data faster or have, uh, you know, more space to do the analysis and stuff like that. Okay. In this figure, um, you can see the details of the SDLC process, which uh, it starts from top left of the figure. And it starts with requests for proposal or RFP process. So it's another perspective toward the system implementation. Uh, there are lots of models and uh, you know figures which depicts the system uh, development life cycle. And here is just another perspective with more details. Uh, you can find some similarities between this model and uh, the one that I described through those seven phases. 
So we start from the top left with um, a request for proposal. So it's just a proposal to be submitted to a vendor uh, in case we want to buy a ready-made system and we do not want to develop it from the scratch ourselves. So we just um, uh, submit a proposal and request for information. Then vendor dem demonstration, uh, it means that the, the vendor provides us with a prototype system and introduces, you know, it's um, already available information system. It could be an EHR, EMR, or a patient portal, or any of those systems that we discussed. Uh, it follows with end user review or vendor fair. And if the review of that information system is positive, then uh, the healthcare organization comes to a contract agreement with that vendor. And then uh, we create uh, teams to work on um, implementing that information system into the clinical setting. Uh, the um, training and certification will happen in this phase. And the train users, um, you know, uh, how to implement the system. And then the validation of the system would happen. And uh, it, it, it follows by the designing and building the system and also testing the system with some real data, clinical data from the healthcare setting. Also in this phase, we develop some curriculum or some material for further training, not only at this pilot phases of system implementation, but also for future. Uh, and introducing the new system for you know new people or new staff are going to use that. Um, in this phase, we also have um, subject matter expert identification. For instance, we can have some groups of um, healthcare professionals who are going to use the system. For instance, nurses, physicians, um, healthcare professionals in allied um, allied medicine. In every group can have its own expert and we identify these experts to facilitate the training process, the adoption and acceptance of the system. Um, we also may provide training for those end users and do cutover activities, implementation, optimization or enhancement of the system and um, provide maybe in case some upgrade installation. So just another uh, picture of system uh, development life cycle with, you know, some uh, more details. Okay, for the final part of my presentation, I just wanted to emphasize um, on this fact that uh, nursing informatics uh, functions was also recognized by ANA in 1994. So nursing informatics was first identified as a specialty by the American Nurse Association or ANA in 1994. And the, A and the ANA described nine functions uh, for a nurse informatics specialist. And if you think about these functions, you can see that these functions are in line with the responsibilities which I defined for a system analyst in this CLC process. So here I just have done a quick mapping between the functions of a nurse informatics specialist and a system analyst. For instance, um, the analysis of, of information, the analysis of information needs defined by the ANA corresponds to phase two and three of the SDLC process, which is determining the human information requirements and analysis, and also uh, depicted in the figure with that highlighted. And um, or the selection uh, of computer system, which corresponds to phase two and three of the SDLC, SDLC process, which is determining the information needs, whether from the human or the system or design of computer systems and customization, which maps to phase four and five of the SDLC process, which is designing the recommended system and uh, developing and documenting the software. 
testing of a computer system, which maps with phase six of the SDLC process, which is testing and maintaining the system. Training users of computer system, which maps with phase seven, which is implementing and evaluating. Evaluation of the effectiveness of the system, which maps with phase seven, which is implementing and evaluating a system. Ongoing maintenance and enhancement, which maps with phase seven, uh, again, which is implementing and evaluating system. And finally, identification of computer technologies that uh, can benefit nursing, which maps with phase seven, again, implementing and evaluating the system. So as you see, you can see that uh, ANA in 1992 have really um, described these nine functions of a nurse informatics specialist. So they should have the competencies to learn to work as a clinical system analyst with these um, wide you know, range of activities. Okay. So to uh, sum up the whole discussion, we know that today's healthcare consumers like patients and their families and even all citizens uh, want to shift for how their care is communicated and provided to them. They want to be more involved in this process. They want to have access to their data and they want transparency and accountability from the healthcare system. So the patient is at the center of nurses do and also other healthcare professionals uh, do every day in, in every moment and whatever touch. Uh, nurses, uh, as you know, maybe the most important part of the healthcare system, which have interaction and communication with patients continuously should try to improve patient care and outcomes uh, through you know, analysis of data, which EHR and other technologies provide to them. For instance, nurses communicate through smartphone apps, video chats, or by monitoring electronic data via wearable devices. And in this way, they try to improve the patient care and outcomes and also uh, address this demand of patients who want to receive uh, more accountable you know, care and more transparency in the care that they receive. So today, nurses explore the newest technology, push for you know, interoperability of that technology you know, to make those um, for instance, EHR shareable between different healthcare organizations and advocated to be incorporated into the system in order to increase the efficiency of, you know, for instance, the clinical documentation. And so increase the time that they are going to spend directly with the patients. So nurses continually seek opportunities to learn uh, and maybe um, that is why that they are thought as leaders. Uh, in the evolution of healthcare, nurse informaticists will continue to remain at the forefront. Okay, uh, here uh, there are the references that I used. And now this is time for some questions, comments, concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azadi. Really enjoyed your valuable lecture. It was really great and exciting. Thank you. Uh, please accept my deepest thanks and appreciation. Uh, I launched the poll before uh, continuing today's meeting. The poll is launched. Maybe it takes a few minutes, a few seconds. Can you see the poll? No. 
At what? least I cannot see. <laughs> I lost it. I don't know why. Oh, it's yeah. lost. Yes. Yeah. Dear participants, we will wait for you to fill these questions for pre post us actually. Thank you. Ten percent of our participants have answered the post it. Professionals to adopt and accept the system and also to provide training. So depending on the size of the organization, uh, we can have um, a number of uh, nurses to be qualified in this. However, as the ANA and also ANIA recommends and also that envision documents by um, EMEA, uh, if I'm not mistaken, all nurses and all healthcare professionals have to be competent in using health information technologies. So in their curriculum or, or through their uh, continuous education, they have to demonstrate level of competencies with different domains, such as um, healthcare information technologies. Um, So the chats, oh, the chat box is a little bit small for me. I um, kind of have difficult time reading them. Uh, I invite you to turn on your microphone and you have any questions, uh, it's time to ask. Can I ask my question? Uh, please uh, just wait for one minute. After the poll is closed, you can ask your question. Thank you. Well, 60% of our participants have answered the questions. Thank you. And maybe we'll wait a um, few seconds for all of the participants to uh, fulfill the questions. Okay, I can see another question. Uh, would you repeat phase one again? So phase one in, of the SDLC process is related to identifying the problem and also opportunities. And it means that uh, the healthcare organization, so why does it want to have an information system? What is really the problem? Are they going to um, you know, do the clinical documentation electronically? Are they going to have an EHR uh, for instance, to do the um, provide the um, clinical documentation through an EHR, which is shareable among different organizations, and they need to have some sort of shareable system. So it's really important to identify the problem because if you do not know, as a clinical analyst, if you do not know what is the problem and uh, the information system is implemented for what reason, then there is this chance that the organization is just waiting, wasting time, energy, and resources for addressing something which was not a problem uh, at the first. Uh, 
about 67. Uh, thank you for, just for participating in post-test. Sixty-eight. Thank you. So, regarding this question for um, uh, nursing system for Iran, um, in fact, most uh, let's say hospital information systems that have been implemented in hospitals in Iran are mainly for handling the administrative part of the process, not to do, you know, to handle the clinical process. So it's ma mainly uh, administrative system, unfortunately, and we have to work on this to, you know, um, encourage hospitals, healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, and also other healthcare professionals, uh, and encourage them in a way to, um, to adopt, you know, um, information system for doing the clinical work. But so far it's mainly for um, autom automization of the administrative jobs of the hospitals. I think one major problem in Iran is that we lack that legislation that pushed hospitals and healthcare settings toward having uh, an information system for handling you know, the clinical process and to provide shareable systems with the ultimate goal of improving patient outcomes. You know? Because this legislation lacks in Iran and we do not have really policies in how to adopt it and how to use the systems, uh, which is uh, lag behind, unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Azadi. Dr. Azadi uh, kindly answered any question that was in the chat box during the uh, post test. But now is the question and answer part. If you have any question, you could um, write in the chat box and you can even uh, raise your hand and we'll activate your voice and you can talk to the Dr. Azadi and We'll hear the question and answers. Thank you. I guess Hamida had a question. Okay. Dear Hamida, could you please raise your hand if you have questions? I saw your hand was raised in, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Azadi. And also again, thank you for uh, Tehran Medical uh, University. Uh, I am Hamdi from uh, Hawler Medical University of Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, my question is, Um, I just didn't hear your voice, Hamida. Would uh, you oh, please? Sorry, sorry. It is, it, okay, now it is okay? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Azadi. Your presentation was very useful and informative. Thank you again for Dr. Ceylani and all your uh, College of Nursing to conduct such uh, interesting topic. Uh, my question is that uh, according your... Uh, information about the Mediterranean countries. Uh, what do you think that how many years we need to improve such system for our healthcare and nursing care? Uh, because we have uh, not just um, uh, the problem of information and skills, also we have the pro uh, um, resources uh, problem, we have uh, computer, internet, uh, for example, Iran, have many um, also 
we can we say limited uh, access to many programs of the internet. We as Iraq also we have and we have another problem uh, attitude of our nurses and our people also. It is very different with the USA. So what do you think? How many years we need to improve such system? Uh, well, I'm, not a, I'm not a futuristic, so I cannot say how many years actually it needs for every country, at least in the region or in the Mediterranean region, um, to take to implement the system. But one thing that I can say based on the, well, the best practices in the world, that um, legislation, education, and uh, or perhaps the most important factors which would facilitate this. If we embed the, you know, like something that in the US through the ANA or ANIA or AMIA have done, and they have provided domains of competencies for all healthcare professionals and nurses to embed those domains of competencies into the education, not only on the, um, at the undergrad, undergraduate education, but also at the postgraduate education, as well as the continuous education. So little by little, this provides that culture that you were referring and also make the nurses students. And um, after the graduation, you would be more ready to get involved in, you know, more in IT solutions projects. On the other hand, if the legislation and that high level authority doesn't require all healthcare systems to uh, get involved with adoption and using HIT, then those, um, uh, education that were provided would be useless. So I think these two components are really important. As long as we can have uh, the policy legislation and the education, we can kind of be positive about uh, reaching to that HIT-based healthcare perhaps um, soon, not very long. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azad. You're welcome. I can see some questions about the slides. Uh, all these slides material and also the video session would be uh, uploaded into the website of this program. And so you can have the slides from there, you can download it. And thank you for actually um, giving attention to my presentation. I hope I managed to provide you with some useful information about nurses role and technology selection design and implementation. I know it's for these countries, especially my country and also other countries in the region, it would be perhaps a long way toward a fully uh, HIT based um, healthcare setting. But uh, it's not impossible. We already have seen the implementation of IT in other industries, such as banking or the e-government, even in our own countries. So it's not really uh, difficult, but needs some facilitators that I emphasized on it. And I hope we can achieve it soon. Um, okay. Thanks a lot, dear Dr. Azadi. We really enjoyed uh, your invaluable lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you participants for very nice questions. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Mohammadi. Uh, are you there, Mr. Mohammadi? Yes, I'm on the line. Okay. So please, I think this is the time you ask a participant to yes. um, uh, on their camera. A grid photo. I know. Thank uh, you. But before taking a grid photo, I have to restate and I mean correct my statement. Uh, uh, it should be announced that we don't have any lecture for next session. I mean, any lecture session for next session. I mean, like uh, next Saturday. And our succeeding online lecture session will be attended on 12th of June. 
and its topic will be clinical Inf informatics systems in nursing presented by Dr. Melody Rose. Uh, thank you for following and, in, and, and joining us. At the end of today's meeting, please uh, kindly, I ask you to uh, open your cameras to take a, a virtual group photo. Thank you all. It's really good to see you. Oh, Dr. Darish, I guess we, we're having Professor Hepta here as well. Hi, Professor Hepta. Yes. <laughs> yes, hi. Thank you for attending our session. Thank you, dear Professor Hepta. And dear all participants, thank you. I'm so happy to be part of this. And once again, a very big thank you to Dr. Darish, Dr. Ceylani, Dr. Nick Bacht, and their amazing team, um, including uh, professors and also students at the Tehran University of Medical Sciences School of Nursing at Midwifery. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Nice to see you all. Thank you for uh, opening your camera. Thank you. Very nice. Think we have very nice photos, group photo. Dr. Darvish, did you take the photo? Uh, yes, some photo I, I took, but I think thank you. Um, Mrs. Smiley prepared some photos. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have to end uh, today's meeting. It was really great. Thank you, Dr. Azadi. We really enjoyed it. Uh, and we'll see you on 12th of June, which is two weeks later. And uh, goodbye all, it was really good to have you here. Good time. Bye-bye. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>